Shalom everyone YouTube land. The majority of the video I'll be doing today will be elementary to those sa savvy veteran tour keepers out there. But it might be a good refresher course. The name of the video is Yahshua plus Torah equals salvation. That's pretty good math, huh? How are you going to have salvation without the combination of the two? Let's see what John thought in Revelations 12:17. And the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went to fight with the remnant of her seed, those guarding the commands of Elohim, and possessing the witness of Yahshua Messiah. Revelations 14, 12. Very similar. Here's the endurance of the set-apart ones. Here are the, those guarding the commands of Elohim and the belief of Yahshua. So we see from these two verses that these believers are keeping Torah, and in addition to, they have faith in Yahshua. Not just one without the other, but both together. Faith alone is not going to cut it, folks. Keeping Torah alone is, isn't going to cut it, either. You have to have both. Has anybody ever heard the statement, Salvation is a free gift from Elohim. Of course, I had to clean it up. But you know what I'm talking about. Really? Where does it say that in Scripture? You should always ask that question. Somebody bring some theology your way. Where is that in Scripture? Show me that from the Scriptures. I found a verse that might be where that teaching comes from. In Ephesians 2, 4-9. through 9. But Elohim, who is rich in compassion because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Messiah. By favor you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenlies in Messiah Yahshua in order to show in the coming ages the exceeding riches of his favor and kindness towards us in Messiah Yahshua for by favor you have been saved through belief and that not of yourselves it is the gift of Elohim it is not by works so that no one should boast didn't see the word free in there anywhere did anybody else but Paul also said in Romans 2.13, For not the hearers of the Torah are righteous in the sight of Elohim, but the doers of the law shall be declared right. So is Paul confused? I don't think so. I think he had a grasp on salvation that's probably better than we will ever have. Christian folks like to say that we are legalistic and we are trying to earn our salvation. If they only knew our hearts, know that we keep Torah because we love Yahweh and have a genuine desire to please Him and walk in His Torah. Amen. Uh, Christians love to quote Paul to say, the Torah is done away with. Of course, what is really going on is they are twisting Paul's writings to try and prove that Torah is done away with. It is kind of hard for something that is eternal to be done away with. Let me repeat that statement. It is kind of hard for something that is eternal to be done away with. But they quote Paul, Paul's words to try and say the Torah is done away with. But let's look at something Paul said in Philippians 2.12. So that my beloved, as you always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much rather in my absence. Work out your own deliverance with fear and trembling. The KJV says salvation in this verse instead of deliverance. What are the key words in this verse? Work out. It sounds like we have to do something to get salvation. Am I wrong on that? If I am, please stop me now. Because I want salvation. I want to be pleasing to y'all. The problem with the idea that salvation is a free gift and we don't have to do anything is that we live in the flesh, not in the spiritual realm. Yahweh commands us to keep Sabbath. Do we keep that in our flesh or in our spirit? Yahweh commands us to not eat pork or shrimp. Do we keep that in our flesh or in our spirit? In the spirit. The believers that make it to the kingdom know what true will know what true salvation is. So, what is the most 
most quoted scripture in Christianity. John 3.16. So let's read that verse. For Elohim so loved the world that he gave his only brought forth son, so that everyone who possesses, believes in him should not perish but possess everlasting life. Christians put so much emphasis on this verse and its importance for salvation, but they disregard and overlook all the times the same word everlasting appears in the Torah. In the KJV, the word everlasting appears 13 times in the Torah. A number of those times is referring to an everlasting covenant or command. I want to read a verse in the scripture that most most Christians overlook, and it's in the New Testament of all places, not in the Old Testament. Matthew 24, 13, just one verse. But he who shall have endured to the end shall be saved. I hear a lot of people talking about how they are saved, or how they got saved, or somebody else they know is saved. When people say these things around me, I cringe for a number of reasons. Some might not like my next statement, but nobody is saved right now. Hope you're sitting down for that one. Is that heresy? I think not. We just read a verse that proves it. Matthew didn't just write it once. He wrote it twice. If something appears more than once in Scripture, we might want to pay attention. I might. So also, he also said it in Matthew 10, 22. You shall be hated for all my name, for all by my name, by all for my name's sake. Excuse me. But he who shall have endured to the end shall be saved. I have even had a pastor get in my face. I mean, in my face, like inches away, like right here. And the reason he got in my face because I told him I did not want to be saved when he asked me. Saying that to a Christian is like saying the Quran is a bunch of baloney to a Muslim. It'll go over like a lead balloon. It will not be easily received. When the pastor asked me if I wanted to be saved, I quoted Matthew 24, 13, when we just read. And he didn't even know what the verse said. He had to ask one of his deacons what it said, and the deacon told him. So the leader of the congregation that gets up and teaches them every week didn't even know what that verse said. It's kind of funny because the deacon was actually open to what I was saying, but not the close-minded preacher. I even took the time to give the deacon a fossilized customs. Whether he read it or not, I don't know, but he was open to what I was sharing with him. And I don't just hand that book out to anybody. Another reason I cringe when folks talk about being saved or getting saved is the fact that they basically just said, Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, Yahweh, can you get off the judgment seat for a minute, please? I want to sit down and pass out some judgment. Now that's scary. That's some scary stuff. It is funny that Christians say all the time, you shouldn't judge, and they misquote and take Yeshua's words out of context when he said, judge not, let you be judged, Matthew 7, 1. If you, if you say you or somebody else is saved, you are passing out the ultimate judgment. Not just any judgment, the ultimate judgment. You are determining who has salvation and who doesn't. You are, not the creator of heaven and earth. You, a fleshly human being. I don't know about you brothers and sisters out there, but I refuse to do that. I refuse to sit on a judgment seat of Elohim. And say I have salvation. Or somebody else has salvation. That is not a place. I'm going to go. Go to. Determining who has salvation. Is up to the creator of the universe. Yahweh Elohim. Not me. I would like to look at a teaching about salvation. That is not scriptural. Once saved. Always saved. So I want to. Start off on this section. I want to read a little excerpt from an online article by one save. I always say, "Quote: Those who say that a person can, I'm going to clean it up to, fall away, walk away, turn away, or backslide away 
from the Father do not understand that the Father has concealed their, canceled their sin debt completely. This includes all fallaways, all walkaways, all turnaways, and all backslideaways from the Father. Since all these things are sins and therefore have all been paid for into the future until we die. To say that a person can walk away or turn from the Father and thus lose salvation assumes that Yahshua forgot to pay for the walkaways and the turnaways. He didn't forget them, however. <coughs> Excuse me. Those sins were also paid for at the cross, and that's why one saved, always saved. Period. There is no way that we can lose our salvation. End quote. Does anybody see anything wrong with this line of logic? The author is pretty much saying that once you get saved, you have a license to sin. <clears throat> you pretty much get a free, get out of jail free card, pretty much. So let's go with that same line of logic for a minute. There was a woman named Jane. Jane gets saved. Confesses J.C. as her Savior and gets baptized. The usual requirements for salvation according to Christian thought. I know this because I've been there. I was raised a Christian. So I know this from experience. She gets saved and later on down the line turns her back on Yahweh and becomes a prostitute. She prostitutes herself for five years and then dies in her sins as a, pros as a prostitute before she can turn back to Yahweh and repent. Does she still have her salvation when she died? I'm not going to sit on the judgment seat. But we all, if you use common sense, you know what the answer is. You know what the correct answer is. For someone to say they have eternal security is a preposterous and ridiculous statement. <laughs> A quick read of Ezekiel 33 will disprove that. And I don't have Ezekiel 33 in this teaching, but I will highly suggest you go read the whole chapter when you're done with watching my video. Ezekiel 33. Go read it. It totally debunks and disproves once saved, always saved. So what is the proof text for once saved, always saved? John 10, 27-29 My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give them everlasting life, and they shall by no means ever perish, and no one shall snatch them out of my hand. My Father, here's the key verse, My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hands. My Father's hand. And that last line is why people think once saved, always saved. It's okay. This is the most commonly used scripture for the once saved, always saved doctrine. Let's examine what the verses are saying and read a couple more verses in context. Let's start in verse 24. So the Yehudim, or the Jews, surrounded him and said to him, How long do you keep us in suspense. If you are the Messiah, say to us plainly. These were people that didn't really believe. They were just seeking a sign. And Messiah addresses that in other places. Verse 25. Yeshua answered them, I have told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness concerning me. But you do not believe. See, there you go. Because you are not of my sheep. As I said to you, my sheep hear my voice. I know them, and they follow me. Yahshua sheep hear his voice. Let's look at something else Yahshua said. You all know these verses very well. But hold your finger here in John 10. We're going to Matthew 5, 17 through 20. Do not think that I came to destroy the Torah of the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to complete. For truly I say to you, till the heaven and the earth 
pass away. One jot or one tittle shall by no means pass from the Torah till all be done. Whoever then breaks one of the least of these commands and teaches men so shall be called least in the reign of the heavens. But whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the reign of the heavens. For I say to you, that unless your righteousness exceeds the, that of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall by no means enter into the reign of the heavens. The Torah of Yahweh is not done away with. It was not done away with when, when Messiah died, and Paul's writings do not do away with it either. The Torah of Yahweh is an everlasting covenant forever between Yahweh and his people. The ones keeping the Torah of Yahweh are Yahshua's sheep, plain and simple. So back to John 10, verse 27. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. They follow me. Would Yahshua lead us into walking contrary to the Torah of Yahweh? Nope. He walked perfectly in it. And I give them everlasting life, and they shall by no means ever perish. <coughs> and no one shall snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. How can someone say they have everlasting life, or say they are saved now, when they haven't even been judged yet? There's a good question to ask. Matthew 24 4 through 13, what we read earlier. Verse 4. And Yeshua answering said to them, Take heed that no one leads you astray. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am the Messiah, and they shall lead many astray. And you shall begin to hear of fightings and reports of fightings. See that you are not troubled, for these have to take place, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and reign against reign, and there shall be scarcities of food and deadly diseases and earthquakes in places. And all these are the beginning of birth pains. Then they shall deliver you up to affliction and kill you. And you shall be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many shall stumble, and they shall deliver up one another, and shall hate one another. <coughs> Excuse me. Getting up, <coughs> getting over a upper story crud. So, excuse me. And then many shall stumble, <coughs> and they shall deliver up one another, and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise up and lead many astray. And because of the increase in lawlessness, the love of the many, the love of many shall become cold. I mean, you can look around the world. There's plenty of lawlessness going on. Nobody. Not many people care about the Torah of Yahweh. Verse 13. But he who shall have endured to the end shall be saved. We see from verse 13 that believers that are going to be saved are the ones who endure to the end. The end is not yet. So how can we say we have salvation? If you endure to the end, you shall be saved. So since we're talking about salvation, what does scripture say about going to heaven and hell. When a per person is giving a video, a teaching, sermon, or whatever, on everlasting life, they usually ask the question, when you, are going, when you are going to die, are you going to heaven or hell? I'm going to preach another choir on this one, but maybe somebody that watches this video has never heard us for. Is the hell taught in church the same as in scripture? The, the word hell in Hebrew is Sheol. If you want to look up the Strong's number, it's H7585. That's H7585. Sheol. Hades or the world of the dead. Grave, hell, pit. This definition has no reference to everlasting punishment like we were taught. One of the words for hell in Greek is Gehenna. That's G. 1067, G1067. It's from the Thayers. Hell is the place of future punishment called Gehenna or Gehenna of Fire. This was originally the valley of Hinnom, south of Jerusalem, where the filth and dead animals of the city were cast out and burned. A fit symbol of the wicked and their future de destruction. 
The other word for hell in Greek is Hades, which is G86. It's G86. Of course, it's the name of a Greek deity. This from Thayer's again. The G.O.D. of the lower regions, the realm of dead, later use of this word, the grave, death, and hell. This definition sounds a lot like the definition of Sheol, very similar. Gehenna is used 12 times in the New Testament. Hades is used 11 times. So why were there two different words used for hell in the New Testament? Maybe the writers of the scriptures had a better understanding of what hell is than we do. So if somebody tells you you're going to hell, you can smile and say, yeah, I know, thanks. So what about going to heaven? Let me back up to clarify about hell. Pretty much when you die, you're just going to a grave. So that's why I said, somebody says, you're going to hell. You just smile and say, thank you. So what about going to heaven? Psalms <clears throat> 37, 28, 29. For Yahweh loves right ruling and does not forsake his kind ones. They shall be guarded forever. But the seed of the wrongdoers is cut off. The righteous shall inherit the earth and dwell in it forever. Isaiah 60, 21. And your people, all of them righteous, shall inherit the earth forever. A branch of my planting, a work of my hands to be adorned. And in the New Testament, Matthew 5, 5. Yahshua said, Blessed are the meek, because they shall inherit the earth. Looks like these three verses are saying that heaven is coming to earth. That contradicts the thought that when a, dire, when a believer dies, they leave earth and go to heaven. So what exactly does scripture say about salvation? Plenty. <clears throat> Isaiah 53 verse 5 which pretty confident chapter is talking about Yeshua. But he who pierced but he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our crookednesses. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. Second Corinthians two, fourteen and fifteen. But thanks be to Elohim who always leads us on to overcome in Messiah and manifest through us the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. Because we are to Elohim the fragrance of Messiah among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. So there are some key words in this last verse. Being saved and who are perishing. So the ones that are being saved are working on their salvation pretty much every day. And the ones that are perishing are dying a slow death in their sin every day. So being saved is a process. It's not something, BAM! You're saved. All of a sudden, there it is. You don't just confess your sins and BAM! Salvation comes to you. Our walk with Yahweh is one day at a time. I want to share a couple verses from the KJV. 1 Corinthians 1.18 For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of Elohim. And 1 Corinthians 15.2 By which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. Notice anything different about these verses than the last verse we read in 2 Corinthians 15? The ISR reads, being saved, and these verses in the KJV read, are saved, as in present tense. The Peshitta reads a little different than the KJV also. I want to read these two verses from the Peshitta. Okay, here we go. And again, just like last time. So 1 Corinthians 
For the word concerning the stake is to them who perish foolishness, but to us who live it is the energy of Elohim. And the other verse is 1 Corinthians 15, 2. And by which you have life. And what word I preach to you, you remember unless you have believed in vain. Instead of saying you are saved, the Prashida words it a little different. says you have life. I think that's really cool how that's worded because we do truly live and have life when we have faith in Yahshua and keep the Torah. It's a killer combo. Not only is being saved a process, but being set apart is a process as well. Let's go to the Torah for this one. Leviticus 22, 31, 32. And you shall guard my commands and do them. I am Yahweh. And do not profane my set-apart name and I shall be set apart among the children of Israel. I am Yahweh who sets you apart. Being set apart, just like being saved, is a process, like I said. It's not going to happen overnight. 1 Corinthians 3, 9 through, 13, 9 through 15. Excuse me. For we are fellow workers of Elohim. You are the field of Elohim, the building of Elohim, according to the favor of Elohim, which was given to me as a wise master builder. I have laid the foundation, and another builds on it. But each one should look how he builds on it. For no one is able to lay any other foundation except that which is laid, which is Yahshua Messiah. And if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work shall be revealed, for the day shall show it up. Because it is revealed by fire, and the fire shall prove the work of each one, what sort it is. If anyone's work remains, which he has built on, he shall receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, but so as through fire. Paul's talking about a future time in verse 15. Speaking of Paul, he was not even sure of his own salvation. What? Well, let's see from his own words. Philippians 3, 11 through 14. If somehow I might attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already received. Not that I have already received. It's Paul talking. It's not Matt talking. We're already been per perfected, but I press on to lay hold of that for which Messiah Yahshua has also laid hold of me. Brothers, I do not count myself to have laid hold of it yet, but only this, forgetting what is behind and reaching out for what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the high calling of Elohim and Messiah Yahshua. Paul wrote about two-thirds of the New Testament. He wasn't even sure of his own salvation. So how can somebody in 2014 and beyond Say, I'm saved, or so and so is saved. How can you do that? One part of receiving salvation is calling on the name of Yahweh. There's different pronunciations. <clears throat> as long as you're calling on his name and you're not calling on L O R D, G O D, Hashem, Jehovah, so on and so forth. We're not going to have a debate about the correct pronunciation, but as long as you're making a sincere, genuine attempt to call on his name, however you pronounce it, you're doing good, according to Joel 2.32 right here. And it shall be that everyone who calls on the name of Yahweh shall be delivered from Mount Zion and in Jerusalem. There shall be an escape, as Yahweh has said, and among the survivors whom Yahweh calls. So you're, you have salvation when you call on his name. So to anybody out there that causes division, stirs up strife, or, or says, you're from the camp of Satan if you don't say it the way I pronounce it, the way I pronounce it, just stop. That's not helping build the kingdom. That's only messing things up.
somebody doesn't pronounce exactly how you do, so what? If they're trying to do their best, show them some mercy and give them some credit. Okay, rant over. Sorry. Notice how the word shall keeps popping up in the verses talking about salvation, referring to a future time. No question we need Yahshua to have salvation. His name means salvation. Yahweh is salvation, or however you pronounce it, to be exact. We cannot get salvation by our own efforts. We need a Savior to receive salvation. Belief in Yahshua is a big part of salvation, though. First Thessalonians 5, 2-9 For you yourselves know very well that the day of Yahweh comes as a thief in the night. For when they say, Peace and safety, then suddenly destruction comes upon them, as labor pains upon a pregnant woman. And they shall not escape. But you, brothers, are not in darkness, so that this day shall overtake you as a thief. For you are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. So then we should not sleep as others do, but we should watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But we who are of the day should be sober, putting on the breastplate of belief and love, and as a helmet of salvation, as a helmet the ex expectation of deliverance. KJV says salvation, said deliverance. And most of the scriptures are the ISR. It's my preferred translation. Because Elohim did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain deliverance through our master, Yahshua Messiah. We have a hope of salvation if we believe in Yahshua. So let's flip back over to John 10 again. Verses 6 through 11 this time. Yahshua used this figure of speech, but they did not know what he had been saying to them. Yahshua therefore said to them again, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep do not hear them. I am the door. Whoever enters through me, he shall be saved and shall go in, shall go out and find pasture. The thief does not come except to steal and to slaughter and to destroy. I have come that they might possess life, that they might possess it beyond measure. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Yahshua is our shepherd, leading us to the path of righteousness. He laid down his life so that we might have salvation, not walk in sin all our lives. The shepherd protects his flock. Verse John 4... 7 through 15. Beloved ones, let us love one another because love is of Elohim, and everyone who loves has been born of Elohim and knows Elohim. The one who does not love does not know Elohim, for Elohim is love. By this, the love of Elohim was manifested in us. The Elohim has sent his only brought forth son into the world in order that we might live through him. Like the Peshitta said, we might have life. We can live through him. And this is love. Not that we loved Elohim, but that he loved us and sent his son to be an atoning offering for our sins. Beloved ones, if Elohim so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has seen Elohim at any time. If we love one another, Elohim does stay in us. And his love has been perfected in us. By this, we know that we stay in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and bear witness that the Father has sent the Son, Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Yeshua is the Son of Elohim, Elohim stays in him and he in Elohim. Chapter 15, 11 through 13. And this is the witness that Elohim has given us everlasting life. And this life is in his son. He who possesses the son possesses life. He who does not possess the son of Elohim does not possess life. 
I have written this to you who believe in the name of the Son of Elohim, so that you know that you possess everlasting life, and so that you believe in the name of the Son of Elohim. Yahshua is our Savior. Excuse me. Yahweh is our Savior through Yahshua. If we confess that Yahshua is the Messiah and believe that he died and was resurrected for our sins, we shall have everlasting life. Yahshua did his part, but we have to do our part too. Our part is following his example and keeping Torah. Psalms 18, 1 and 2. I love you, O Yahweh, my strength. Yahweh is my rock and my stronghold, and my deliverer, my El is my rock. I take refuge in him, my shield and the horn of my deliverance, my high tower. Verse 46 in the same chapter. Yahweh lives, and blessed is my rock, and exalted is the Elohim of my deliverance. Psalms 27 1. Yahweh is my light and my deliverance. Whom should I fear? Yahweh is the refuge of my life. Whom should I dread? 2 Samuel 22 47. Yahweh lives, and blessed is my rock, and exalted is my Elohim, the rock of my deliverance. The Almighty, Yahweh, is the rock of of our salvation. We need to live a life pleasing to Him or how will we have salvation? Live a life to honor Him in all that we do. Not just honor Him when we come to service on Sabbath or the feast days, but every day of the week. To receive salvation from Yahweh, a sincere repentance must take place. Let's look at some scriptures about repentance. And repentance isn't just a one-time thing. It has to be continual. Because you're not going to be free from sin once you start walking in the truth and in the Torah. Second, Second Timothy 2, 21 through 26. If then anyone cleanses himself from these matters, he shall be a vessel unto value, having been set apart of good use to the master, having been prepared for every good work, and flee from the lust of youth, but pursue righteousness, belief, love, peace, with those calling on the master out of a clean heart, but refuse foolish and stupid questions, knowing that they breed quarrels. And a servant of the master shall not quarrel, but be gentle towards all, able to teach, patient when wronged. That one's pretty tough. I need to hear that one. In meekness, instructing those who are in opposition, lest somehow Elohim gives them repentance unto a thorough knowledge of the truth. And they came to their senses out of the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his desire. Repentance. Now that is a gift from Yahweh. To do his will and not the will of Hashitan or our own will. We can serve Hashitan just as easily as we can serve Yahweh. Keep that in the back of your mind. True repentance is the only way to get out of the snare of Hashitan and walk the straight and narrow path of Torah. 2 Corinthians 7, 8-12 through 12. For even if I made you sad with my letter, I do not regret it, though I did regret it. For I perceived that the same letter made you sad, even if for an hour. I now rejoice not that you were made sad, but that you were saddened into repenting. For you were made sad according to Elohim, so that you suffered no loss from us. For sadness according to Elohim works repentance, to deliverance not to be regretted, but the sadness of the world works death. For see, how have you been saddened according to Elohim, how much it worked out in you eagerness. Indeed, clearing of yourselves, indeed displeasure, indeed fear, indeed longing, indeed ardor, indeed righting of wrong. In every way, you proved yourself to be clear in the matter. So, although I wrote to you, it was not for the sake of him who had done the wrong, nor for the sake of him who suffered wrong, but for the sake of revealing our diligence for you before Elohim. I want to read these verses again in the KJV. Let's play a game. Let's see how many times you can count the words sorry, sorrow, and sorrowed. That's sorry, sorrow, and sorrow. 
All right, so how many you can count? I'll read the same exact verses. For though I made you sorry with a letter, I do not repent. Though I did repent, for I perceive that the same epistle hath made you sorry, though it were but for a season. Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that you sorrowed to repentance. For you were made sorry after a set-apart manner. I have to clean it up. That you might receive damage by us in nothing. For set apart, sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. For behold this selfsame thing, that ye sorrowed after a set apart sort, what carefulness it wrought in you, yeah, what clearing of yourselves, yeah, what indignation, yeah, what fear, yeah, what vehement desire. Yeah, what zeal, yeah, what revenge, in all things, ye have approved yourselves to be clear in this matter. Wherefore, though I wrote unto you, I did not for his cause that had done the wrong, nor his cause that suffered wrong, but that our care for you in the sight of Elohim might appear unto you. So, class, how many did you count? He got eight. Ding, ding, ding. You get a cookie. To truly repent of our sins, we need to feel sorrowful and lament over the sins we have committed and repent of them. Not just feel sorry, but repent too. And confess them. Next verse of scripture is Isaiah 57, 13 through 15. I'm going to read the, these in the KJV. When thou criest, let thy companies deliver thee. But the wind shall carry them all away. Vanity shall take them away. But he that putteth his trust in me shall possess the land and shall inherit my set-apart mountain. And shall say, Cast ye up, cast ye up, prepare the way. Take up the stumbling block out of the way of my people. For thus said the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is set apart. I dwell in the high and set-apart place with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. So kids, what does contrite mean? According to dictionary.com, caused by or showing sincere remorse, filled with the sense of guilt and the desire for atonement, penitent, a contrite sinner. So pretty much it's synonymous with repentant. So reading on, same chapter in the ISR, 16 through 21. For I will not strive forever, nor am I wroth forever, for the spirit will grow faint before me, even the beings I have made. For the crookedness of his unfair gain I was wroth, and I smote him. I hid myself and was wroth, and went on backsliding in the way of his heart. I have seen his ways, but now I heal him. And I lead him, and restore comforts to him and to his mourners, creating the fruit of the lips. Peace, peace to him who is far off, and to him who is near, said Yahweh. And I shall heal him. But the wrong are like the troubled sea, for it is unable to rest. And its waters cast up mud and dirt. There is no peace, said my Elohim, for the wrong. Yahweh is a merciful and loving Elohim. If we repent, he won't strive with us forever. He will bless us with shalom and heal our broken hearts when we come to him, sincerely repent. And don't come with the mindset that you have a license to sin. James 4, 6 through 10. But he gives fa greater favor because of this. He says, Elohim resists the proud, but gives favor to the humble. So then subject yourselves to Elohim. Resist the devil and he shall flee from you. Draw near to Elohim, and he shall draw near to you. Cleanse hands, sinners, and cleanse the hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning, and your joy to dejection. Humble yourselves on the side of the Master, and he shall lift you up. When we put our pride to the side and humble ourselves before Yahweh, then and only then will, he, will we be forgiven for our sins. If we are not humble, we will be humbled. You can take that one to the bank and cash the check, because it's going to happen. 
to the Torah. Exodus 34, 6 and 7. So before I read these verses, I'm going to go on another rant for those out there that say, Oh, the Elohim of the Old Testament, he was such a hateful Elohim. But now in the New Testament, he must have got some counseling and some good prescription drugs. Now he's all loving. So let's keep that in mind when we read these two verses. Exodus 34, 6 and 7. And Yahweh passed before him and proclaimed, Yahweh, Yahweh, and El compassionate and showing favor, patient and great in kindness and truth. Great in kindness. Not just average or good, but great. Watching over kindness for thousands, forgiving crookedness and transgression and sin, but by no means leaving unpunished, visiting the crookedness of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. So our choices can affect our children and our children's children, either blessing or cursing them. Don't know what everybody's view is on generational curses, but it's pretty easy to see that a, some, a sin that you can commit can cause a generational curse to, to the third or fourth generation after you. So everything you do, every choice you make is important. Not just for you, but for your children, their children, and their children. I have no idea how huge of an impact our decisions make on others. Yahweh is a merciful and loving Elohim, but he is also fair and just Elohim. If someone is walking in disobedience and crookedness, they will get punished. He will punish them. If someone is walking in obedience, he will bless them. The choices we make have huge ramifications. We can, we can commit a sin that can affect next generation, like I said before. So there might be somebody out there thinking, well, why are all these people living in sin and they're blessed? You can see in the New Testament, somewhere in John, I don't have it in the presentation, but it says he reigns on the just and the unjust. Good things happen to good people, bad things happen to bad people, and vice versa for bad people. Just because you see somebody living in sin and they've got a nice house, car, riding on 20s, whatever, Rolex watch, that don't matter. They have no peace. Even though they have all that stuff, they have no peace. Most likely because they don't have a relationship with the Creator. So just look past the stuff they have. So next verse of scripture is John 5, 37 through 47. And the Father who sent me, he bore witness of me. You have neither heard his voice <coughs> at any time, nor seen his form. And you do not have his word staying in you, because you do not believe him who he sent you search the scriptures because you think you possess everlasting life in them. And those are the ones that bear witness of me. <coughs> Woo! That is a scary verse. I read the scriptures on a regular basis. Hope everybody else out there does. I hope I don't fall into that category that she was referring to in that last verse. That's scary. Verse 40. But you do not desire to come to me in order to possess life. I do not receive esteem from men, but I know you, that you do not have the love of Elohim in you. I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, him you would receive. How are you able to believe when you are receiving esteem from one another? And the esteem that is from the only Elohim you do not seek. Do not think that I shall accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moshe, on whom you have set your expectation. For if you believe Moshe, you would have believed me, since he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, how shall you believe my words? It's hard to read the Tanakh and not read something about Yahshua. The Torah and the prophets spoke about Yahshua a bunch. 
We need Yahshua in our lives to have salvation. Revelations 22, 14, and 15. Blessed are those doing his commands, so that the authority shall be theirs unto the tree of life, and to enter through the gates into the city. But outside of the dogs and those who enchant with drugs and those who whore and the murderers and the idolaters and all who love and do falsehood. The believers who kept Torah were inside the city. The people not keeping Torah were outside. Do we want to be outside with the dogs or inside with the other believers? Matthew 7, 13 through a good chunk. 27. Enter in through the narrow gate, because the gate is wide, and the way is broad that leads to destruction, and there are many who enter through it. Because the gate is narrow, and the way is hard pressed, which leads to life, and there are few who find it. But beware of the false prophets, who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are savage wolves. By their fruits you shall know them. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes, or figs from thistles? So every good tree yields good fruit, but a rotten tree yields wicked fruit. A good fruit is unable to yield wicked fruit, and a rotten tree to yield good fruit. Just FYI, all of this verbiage, this is judging. For anybody that says, judge not lest you be judged. If you're judging somebody's fruit, or you're looking at somebody's fruit that they bear, you're judging them. It's not a sin to judge. You do it righteously. With the righteous judgment, like Messiah said. In John. Verse 20. No, verse 19. <clears throat> Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then, by their fruits you shall know them. Judging. Not everyone who says to me, Master, Master, shall enter into the reign of the heavens. But he who is doing the desire of my Father in the heavens. Many shall say to me in that day, Master, Master, have we not prophesied in your name and cast out demons in your name and done many mighty works in your name? And then I shall declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who work lawlessness. You who don't walk in the Torah. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and does them shall be like a wise man who built his house on the rock and the rain came down and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house and it did not fall for it was founded on the rock and everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them shall be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand and the rain came down and the floods came and the winds blew <coughs> and beat on that house and it fell and great was its fall if our life and our spiritual walk are founded on the rock, we're going to be all right. When we start to trust in ourselves and become wise in our own eyes and play Elohim, then we will get into a lot of trouble. A lot of people ask themselves and others, what must I do to receive everlasting life? What we should be asking ourselves is, Yahweh, what must I do to be your servant? We have to live our life for Yahweh one day at a time. Yes, we need to be concerned of where we are going for eternity, but we can't receive eternal life without being obedient to Yahweh. Shalom.